Yes, I think you know, need might have been a bit strong in the sense of like for survival in terms of infants literally need us to um, to stay alive during those years, and that's you know part of the human condition that happens you know for eight, nine, ten years, um, and then we have adolescence where it's sort of mixed that we aren't quite on our own. You know, we we could probably stay alive in a lot of situations, environments, and in, in the second decade, but it's a luxury we have this transition um, um, to do that. And I think historically it was thought whatever the cutoff, whether it was 12 or 14 or 16 or 18, in terms of, um, but at some point you were you know, on your own. You sort of the, job, the parent was done um, you know, out the door and, and sink or swim on your own. But what, what the, the brain imaging and other uh, biology studies suggest is that there's still a, a lot of, of changes going on past age 18 you know, into the mid-20s. And, and it's not, again, that the brain is broken or defective, but it's not as good as it's going to get in things like long-range planning and really thinking about you know, decades down the road and controlling impulses and in terms of organizing um, things. And so this is a sense that, we're, that the parents still have a, a huge, uh, potentially positive role to play by um, helping with these sort of decisions. But at the same time, balancing that with you need to have independence for the adolescents. You can't protect them you know, completely. It's this this tug of war that is so hard to get just right. Because without the experiences, without the responsibilities and the freedoms interacting, then the, the brain wouldn't uh, learn the skills that it's going to need to to function independently. A big aspect of this is this notion of modeling. So not the voguing and by, but modeling as in terms of learning by example. The brain's really good at that in terms of um, often when we're very young, it's directly from parents and during the second decade more from peers, but it's a very powerful way that the brain changes. And the modeling in the sense of learning by example has broadened so much with the internet and being able to see what teens around the world um, are experiencing. And some of these are read incredible positive social changes in the Arab Spring and other things, the, the power of uniting young people's passions and interests. So I think as this um, adolescent brain is changing and adapting, that this idea of modeling, which with the parents will be a big part of, because it's not just these sort of talks where the parent tells the, the teen you know, uh, what's, what to believe in and what to do. It's the everyday little things of, by example, um, what, we, uh, what we say to our spouse is what we say when we're cut off in traffic, how we manage our time how we manage our emotions. It's the little everyday things that is what's teaching the adolescents. I see this in my private practice when I talk to adolescents. It's often the, the little things that the parent said to another parent while the child's in the back about, weren't you proud of how he did this today or that today? They're not even directly praising the child, but they hear that. They, and they learn by example of uh, how to manage their emotions and passions and, and organize their time. So I think in that sense, parents should, we're always on. We're, we're, whether we're meaning to or not, we're teaching by example. And that's how the brain works. The brain is really tuned in to learning by example from people in your life that you value and respect. And contrary to what a lot of parents believe, it, the teens do care what their parents think about them. They may not express it directly, but they, they really do uh, care and they want the, you know, the parents to be proud of them and to have uh, an impact on their life at the same time while striving for independence.